Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there. I'm here on the Skype and the podcast with our good friend and Mob Museum blogger from down south of me, Larry Henry. Welcome, Larry. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. All right, folks, don't forget, hit me up on the Venmo, buy me a cup of coffee, you know, at Gangland Wire, just a couple of three bucks. I'd like to have an, a, a, a Starbucks cup of coffee. You know, they're awful expensive. I'm just kidding out there. You can buy me a shot in the beer, too. So a few of you guys have bought. So we got we to do something to keep playing, paying Blueberry for keeping this podcast up, and, and every little bit helps. Well, Larry, I, I, I've been watching and reading your Mob Museum blog, and it's really interesting. I like, they're like short and sweet and, and tell stories, and I like those individual stories, and, and that's what you're a master at out there in that Mob Museum. How long have you been doing that? Um, almost a couple of years now, Gary. I've done it for another site for a while. Um, a different blog, and then um, uh, about uh, almost two years ago, I started writing that monthly blog post for the Mob Museum. It's called The Mob and Pop Culture. Every month, I try to take a look at something that's going on with books and movies in the mob world. Uh, interesting. Uh, you know, and you, you were a newsman in Las Vegas for quite a while during a lot of those activities that I talk about in my uh, film, Gangland Wire. Yeah, I was uh, in Las Vegas. I was at the Las Vegas Sun. I was up in Reno at the Reno Gazette Journal, and I was down in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas Sun. Uh, I was out in Nevada for almost 20 years, and so, yeah, that was, I ended up uh, uh, working at the Sun in the mid-90s and uh, uh, was in Nevada through the late 90s. Uh, so you never met uh, Lefty Rosenthal and, and Tony Splatro. You never, you never gambled with them at the uh, Stardust, huh? Not to my knowledge, but the Stardust <laughs> was open, and I have a lot of, I'm a little bit of a uh, memorabilia junkie, and so I've got some yeah. memorabilia from those days, including from the Stardust. <laughs> oh, great, great. Well, folks, uh, we want to get on with it. I, this last blog piece that you put up, Larry, I thought was really interesting, and a guy that I want to do maybe a really in-depth dive on one of these days, Johnny Roselli from the Chicago Outfit. He's, he's such an interesting guy, uh, you know, uh, he came from New York, I believe, didn't he? He was uh, from Boston. He had come from Boston. He born, yeah, he was born in, well, yeah, back, back east. He was born in Italy and um, came over, born in 1905 and came over later, I think around 1911. His dad had come over earlier. His dad died young, Gary, and he sort of bounced around um, as a teenager in some criminal activity. This was the bootlegging era and he bounced around from boston with a friend of his another criminal associate young guy teenager both teenagers went up to chicago and then over to los angeles he said to the key Farber commission he ended up in los angeles when he was about 15 so that would have been around 1920 but um yeah so he bounced around a lot as a teenager ended up in los angeles in hollywood and got really connected with that bootlegging crowd out in los angeles Gary, those ships, those gambling ships offshore and uh, the bootlegging uh, groups out in L.A. and uh, established himself with uh, with the movie crowd, with uh, actors and producers and directors and people like that and began to have a lot of influence as time went by, not as a teenager, but as time went by. Yeah, you know, uh, another interesting thing about that whole early time in Los Angeles, which we're going to get really get into your uh, how he's connected to some real deal movies and they'll make real movies which is kind of the uh the, the real subject of this thing but he he got involved with a, a guy named tony conero who uh, was a bootlegger out in las vegas and i mean los angeles and he worked for him uh, i found it and he was they were kind of loosely connected to jack dragon he was you know he, he was italian so he had to move in those circles and and they had to kick up to jack dragoners no doubt about it if uh, that guy was if uh, cornero was going to run a, uh, a bootlegging operation so he started out just like all these other guys did back east or in chicago and taylor street area working in the bootlegging business and and then you know what another you never know what connections you're going to make larry when you're young and you probably had that in your own life. I know I have it. And Conero ends up being building the first kind of fancy Las Vegas casino called the, I think it was the Meadow Club. Uh, God, I have to look at my notes here, but I, I believe it's the Meadow Club. It was, a, it was really, it was for Bugsy Siegel and all of them. He built, right, built a really nice club out there in what would eventually become the Strip, which would be outside of town. 
Yeah, that early Los Angeles crowd got involved in Las Vegas, definitely, before, you know, then the New York crowd moved in with, with Bugsy Siegel. And, you know, Roselli, it's funny, Gary, because Roselli was really associated with a lot of different uh, uh, syndicate groups from different cities. For instance, uh, Roselli was involved in the early days in the, uh, in the Tropicana, which opened in 1957. Roselli was kind of a go-between. The New Orleans crowd was involved in that, the Chicago crowd, the New York crowd. And Roselli was sort of a person, he was, he was known as a mob fixer in Los Angeles and Las Vegas and, and, and helped facilitate uh, a lot of the uh, pulling together of the Tropicana, even lived there after it opened and had the had the gift shop concession had the parking concession so that was kind of his that was kind of his thing Gary he was he was a guy who sort of he was the he was the person you went to to get things done in Las Las Vegas now also back west to Los Angeles he also became known as somebody who could really make a lot of things happen in the movie industry with uh, w- with the syndicate and uh, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit but for instance he got involved and ended up going to federal prison for uh, his role in a in a Hollywood extortion plot for a labor piece with the Chicago outfit with some people who were involved in that and that that ended up sending him to to prison so in Los Angeles in Las Vegas just kind of a fixer a guy in fact his business card referred to him as a strategist he's a guy <laughs> that everybody went to to get things done yeah, I was reading up on that Hollywood extortion. I, I touched on that in an earlier podcast. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, Johnny Roselli, he was he was a smooth guy. He he was a, a dapper dude who he who could he kind of changed his language from the street language to where he could uh, could talk to those Hollywood uh, moguls and and things like that. And he uh, there's a guy named Willie Byoff. Who was from Chicago, I believe originally. He he was a pimp, basic basically, and uh, ran, he he was an early uh, human trafficker, is what I've read about him. Forced girls into prostitution and kept them there by means of uh, of intimidation. And Byoff was bragging about extorting some uh, uh, movie theaters in Chicago really loudly, and some other Chicago mob guys overheard it, and and they jumped on Byoff. And, and and realized that you could get in those uh, stagehand unions in Chicago and and make some money by threatening to bomb the theaters or throwing stink bombs and stuff in the theaters or burning theaters down and and keep labor problems down at the same time because they got in with the labor unions and then they moved the whole operation to uh, Los Angeles. I mean, yeah, to Hollywood, to Los Angeles and Hollywood. And, and Roselli got involved then with uh, Paul Rico. Was Paul Rico was a smooth guy. Uh, Frank Nitti was a actual boss at that time, but he was not that good a boss. For, uh, Paul Rico was a real boss and a real power behind the throne. And, and he was a smooth guy, just like Johnny Roselli. I read somewhere where he kind of patterned himself after Paul Rico. He wanted to be like Paul Rico. And they oversaw this whole thing. Roselli was their guy out in. Los Angeles, who could go in and talk to these, uh, said, you know, Jack Warner and people like that, and and be a fixer for them. Of course, how they fix things was, you know, you give us fifty thousand dollars and you won't have any problem with your union, and you give us a hundred thousand dollars and you won't have any problem with your movie theaters, because at the time, like Warner Brothers owned a whole string of movie theaters throughout the United States, uh, and and distributed their movies that way, so they could go out anywhere in the United States and and bomb their theaters. And, smoke bomb them or, or whatever. And, and, you know, that all fell. So that's kind of Johnny Roselli's, you know, he got into the movie business that way. And he came back, it sounds like from your article, he came back to the movie business after they all did a little time for this uh, Hollywood extortion. Is, would that be correct? That's exactly right, Gary. He, uh, you know, they extorted enormous sums of money out of these uh, Hollywood studios and big name Hollywood executives running these studios paid a lot of money to this to this extortion group, which included Roselli. Now they did go down. Um, Roselli joined the army. He was trying to sort of get out of the way of all that, but he ended up he ended up uh, 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 being convicted and sentenced for it. Went to Atlanta and I think up to Indiana. Now. They got paroled early. He got paroled early in the late 40s, um, earlier than his sentence. I think it was a 10-year sentence, and he got paroled, I think, after three three years and seven months, something like that. Part of his uh, parole stipulation, Gary, was that he find a job. So he went back to Hollywood, 
you know, despite burning a lot of these people in this extortion plot, he still had a lot of friends and a lot of connections in Hollywood and, and, and was a really was a big player. You know, he doesn't get the he doesn't get the recognition that a lot of people do in the mafia world. But but Roselli was a really big player, real suave guy, real uh, sort of behind the scenes guy, went back to Hollywood, got a got a job at one of these uh, poverty row theaters that made what then were crime capers. Now they're called film noir, but this was the late forties. Mm-hmm. And he got involved with, uh, with a studio that, that made some of these, uh, some of these B movies, some of these crime capers, which now are considered classics of film noir. When you watch, uh, TCM, when you see, uh, noir alley with, uh, all these noir movies that come on these movies, t- t- two of the ones that he was m- most prominent in, he, he had a, he had a role as a producer, were uh, Canyon City and He Walked by Night, both based on on true incidents that occurred around the time they were making the movies. In fact, one of the one of the interesting aspects of Canyon City in Colorado, at the Colorado uh, uh, State Penitentiary, just south of Denver, and and uh, uh, long time penitentiary there, there was a breakout. When you go watch the movie, it's interesting, Gary, because the actual well, it was kind of a they did a kind of a semi-realist documentary style movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, the war. The, the actual warden is in the movie, mm-hmm. as are some actual convicts of that time. It's just kind of an interesting take. And Roselli was he had gotten on originally as uh, sort of a lower level job, paying sixty, sixty-five dollars a week, then sort of worked his way into the into the producing role and had a heavy hand and it wanted to continue doing that as time went by, but never really was able to make a lot of money out of movies, but he had a big role in all that movie making process. Interesting. You know, that whole, uh, when, when that whole extortion thing during the war fell, uh, the reason that fell, uh, art, uh, was, uh, well, shall we say, uh, uh, Robert Montgomery got to play kind of a real lo- role in real life as, a uh, maybe not an action hero, but a hero. He was, he was a president of the Screen Actors Guild and he found out about a lot of this extortion going on and how the, the, the producers, uh, the studio heads were just paying them off and just kowtowing to them. And, and he, they came after the Screen Actors Guild and he was the president of it. He said, no, there ain't no way. And he went to the IRS and the IRS started looking at the kind of their main guy out there, this Willie Byoff, who uh, who was living a real lavish lifestyle. I mean, you know, uh, Al Capone, somebody, he didn't learn anything from Al Capone. He lived this huge, lavish lifestyle, a uh, $100,000 house. And during a time when a, uh, you know, $10,000 house was a, was a pretty decent house in, uh, in uh, late 40s, early 50s, middle 40s. And and it was easy. It was a no brainer. And, and he got scared and he turned and, and testified against Paul Rica. Paul Rica's only time he did in jail was, was for that. And Johnny Roselli. And, uh, there's a couple others. I, I can't remember. Did Tony Accardo take a hit out of that? I can't remember for sure, but there's two or three others. And, and another interesting story about what you just said is when they got out of jail, they got those 10 year sentences there was a huge kerfuffle when they got released after about three years. And some of them, they weren't supposed to go back to Chicago, but they did anyway. Tom Clark was Harry Truman's uh, um, attorney general. And the mob in Chicago in the 1948 election, you know, had thrown everything behind Harry Truman. Uh, And it was a close election. If you remember, you know, Dewey defeats Truman, Truman, but Truman actually won and, and became the president and the mob uh, and the politicians in Chicago would really help Harry Truman get elected. And, you know, they had all kinds of hearings about Tom Clark and that he was just some kind of a political payoff, helping these guys get out of jail and, and all that. So it, and it all kind of died out pretty quickly after Harry Truman left the White House. But, you know, kind of reminiscent of some things today, you know, everything old is new again. Uh, <laughs> it, it definitely is. You know, the funny the funny thing about it, too, Gary, he was, you know, Roselli continued to have contacts and friends in the movie industry even after he went down on that extortion deal. He was just a real he was friends with Alan Smiley. Alan Smiley was the guy who was on the couch when Ben when Ben Siegel was shot. And so mm-hmm. he was really connected with Dragna. Went up in 1927. Lee Server, who uh, who wrote a recent book about about Johnny Roselli, uh, in his book, Server says he really got to know Capone 
Roselli did during the uh, Jack Dempsey Gene Tunney fight up in uh, Chicago at Soldier Field in 1927. 300 or so people from the movie industry, gangsters, movie stars, people like that, got on a train and went up to Chicago for the for the Dempsey Tunney fight. It was it was a rematch from the year earlier in Philly. So uh, they all went up there after the fight. Tony won. That was a famous long count fight at Soldier Field where the referee Dempsey didn't knock Tony down and didn't get over to his corner quick enough. And Tony got up and won at the, the fighting Marine. But so then they go to a, an event over at the hotel where Capone was. Al Jolson was there and people like that. And so that's where Roselli, this was 1927. So presumably um, if that's when he first met Capone, that was, uh, he was in his early 20s. I think Capone was late 20s. Roselli was in his early 20s then and began to forge a relationship with Capone. Later, Capone went to L.A., uh, stayed at the Biltmore in downtown L.A. and was, uh, Roselli showed up to sort of help him. Uh, he was uh, being ushered out of town, Capone was, and, and his group. He wasn't wanted there. So Roselli showed up and, and they began to forge a friendship there that then carried over uh, to later years with, uh, with uh, his connection, Roselli's connection to Chicago, as Roselli also began to make his way into Las Vegas. So it's just real interesting, Gary, how these connections are intertwined, but it really all really gets back to how heavily Roselli was just connected in that L.A. Hollywood movie world. Real uh, debonair guy. He was a real uh, playboy. Uh, the FBI, Seymour Hersh, uh, has reported that the FBI says that Roselli was responsible for 13 murders. He was no, uh, he, you know, he was no innocent person, but he was really highly connected with that Hollywood world, and it never went away. Even after he uh, he went to prison for extorting them, you would think they would ostracize him, but he stayed connected in that world. You know, it's. Uh, uh... People, uh, lots of times people, especially back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, on up to maybe the 60s, uh, you know, it was kind of cool to, to have your pet mobster, shall we say. Somebody, I know a guy, you know, I can, I can take, get that taken care of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that kind of a thing. And, and Roselli, he must have been slick and smooth there. There's another kind of a well-known case, the uh, Friars Club car yeah. cheating case or scandal. He was all involved in that. That was all these high-end people. Uh, Tony Martin was a singer. Uh, Phil Silvers, I know you've heard of him, was Sergeant Bilko, I think. And then Phil Silvers played Sergeant Bilko and Zeppo Marx, the Marx Brothers. They all like to play gin. And and he said he with some other guys out there, they were all Jewish guys and from the sound of their names, set up this gin game and they used uh, uh, hidden cameras or uh, peepholes or some I think it was probably before cameras peepholes to see who had what cards and they were cheating these guys systematically out of money they say let me look here it says as much as thirty thousand dollars would uh, change hands and and losses over a period of time were uh, more than a million dollars uh, so that's uh, he, he you know he could just operate and he must have been really smooth because he could continue to operate Super smooth guy. I think I think uh, Sinatra uh, is the one. Sinatra and some others are the ones who uh, who uh, recommended Roselli as a member of the Friars Club. I, yeah, I think there was a guy up in the in a, in a, in a crawlway or something who yeah, was using yeah. some elaborate. I think they would buzz the guy or something. Something they, like they, that. They yeah, you're right. Sinatra did introduce him. <laughs> he was, he was the in, so. And Roselli was right in the middle of that. And, it, and you know the funny thing about it is Gary. D despite all these things where he caused problems for people who were supporters, he even married a uh, film star named June Lame. And this guy was in in heavy, but then he he never really, they continued to to like and trust him until the very end. Then he got involved, uh, he got involved with uh, Howard Hughes's uh, right-hand man, got him involved in a, in a CIA plot to topple, to kill Castro during the JFK years. And so, all that sort of culminated into what ended up being the end of his life. He was found in 1976 floating in a 55-gallon oil drum. I think they had hacked off his legs and to stuff him into that drum. He was only 71. And uh, so, you know, he, he had a real high drama life. When you look at the arc of his life, the way he had gone from Boston to L.A. as a, as a teenager, got involved with these bootleggers, uh, was, a real, was a real playboy involved with... Uh, with uh, all sorts of people in that world, got involved in making films, 
uh, got involved in Las Vegas with a lot of deal making in Las Vegas, got involved in this Friars Club thing, the CIA plot. The guy had a real action packed life, to <laughs> say the least. I mean, he was really a high profile player. In a lot of ways, it's kind of interesting that he doesn't get the ink and the play that some other mobsters get who are you know, part of the New York or Chicago crowd because Roselli was a big time player and, and uh, he's just now starting to get a lot of play. The uh, F- uh, Film Noir Foundation, which is Eddie Muller's foundation that he runs, the guy who does those uh, TCM Noir Alley setups, his foundation has a magazine called Noir City, which is really fascinating, by the way. It's an e-magazine that they put out. They just did in their recent issue, Gary, they just did a big piece on Chicago's involvement in Hollywood and also a, a separate breakout piece on Roselli, Handsome Johnny, they called him. So he's now starting to get a lot of play, which is really interesting. Yeah, and, and another reason he's he was such a big player that we didn't really realize when he knew so many people. I think he, he just knew so many people, but when they want, when the CIA said, you know, we need some help killing Castro and we can't seem to do it, who who knows about Cuba and, and, and the seamy underbelly of Cuba? And it's, well, the mob does. Yeah. So, you know, first thing they do is they, they reach out to, I think his guy's name was Mayhew. He was Howard yeah. Hughes' assistant. Yeah. He was former FBI agent. I mean, this was, this was a, uh, <laughs> a witch's brew, shall we say, of, of people <laughs> that were involved in different backgrounds, the CIA, the FBI, Howard Hughes. I mean, you can't, you can't write this kind of stuff. But, so they go to uh, Howard Hughes' fixer. And he says, well, let me ask her out. And, you know, of course, Johnny Roselli is the guy. He's the he's the guy that you can find, but yeah, and and he's really well connected too. Uh, you that, know, and that, just, you can't write that kind of stuff, man. There he is, and so then he moves on that. I mean, he's and, part of history there, the whole JFK assassination plot, and, it's and insane. you know, trying to kill Castro. It, it, it is, it's insane. This guy, you know, hardly anybody's ever heard of him. And they get he gets. I mean, you know, G, it's it's him, Gian Con, and Traficante who are in the middle of this, who are in the middle of this plot with all kinds of. When you look back on it, all kinds of uh, uh, really interesting plots. I think you had some poison pill things going on. Yeah. They were trying all kinds of different ways to figure out how to knock off Castro. They were training some some people down in uh, down, I think, in the Everglades. So yeah. it's just really interesting the way he the way he was such a big player. He was even really close to uh, they they called her Judy Campbell at the time, Judith Campbell Exner. Oh yeah. Uh, who I mean he just is always in the middle. He's kind of the Forrest Gump of the mob world, Gary. He's yeah. in the middle of everything. And so, you know, Giancana, Sam Giancana, the Chicago uh, mobster and President Kennedy, uh, President JF uh, John Kennedy, uh, were were both uh, romantically involved with uh, with uh, Judith Campbell Exner. A lot of suspicion, uh, a lot of accusations about the connection between organized crime and politics. And Roselli was a very good friend of hers. He was very close to her and and, and got mixed up in all that, too. So every time you look up, Gary, with a a big mob, uh, you know, mafia scandal, high profile stuff, movies and all that. There's old there's old Roselli right in the middle of it. That's crazy. I I bet he what do you want to bet? He and Judith Campbell Exner were an item before he probably introduced her to Giancana. <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't think was, this guy let one slip by that he didn't uh, have, diddle around with, shall we he say. Was, he was very active. <laughs> I, I, I think I mentioned this uh, one uh, informant uh, said of Roselli that he was sex crazy. I mean, this guy mm. was, 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 you know, he, Server Lee Server in his book tells a story about, um, the daughter of a uh, of an Illinois newspaper publisher owner flew to Mexico. She had gone out to California in the in the winter of 1937 to get away from that Illinois weather with her mother and have a little fun out in in uh, out in Southern California. Billy Wilkerson, the Hollywood reporter uh, owner publisher, who ended up you know at the beginning stages of the Flamingo is kind of a little sidebar. Anyway, Wilkerson inter- introduced her to to uh to uh, roselli they go down to mexico have a quickie marriage because her parents didn't want her involved in any sexual activity until she was married quickly get it an old fly back to la her dad finds out about this has her admitted to a psychiatric facility where she has therapeutic electroshock treatment so oh, man. 
every time you look up, and that's that's a that's a, a fascinating episode of Lee Sorvis' book. But every time you look up, Roselli's just right in the middle of one interesting thing after another. Uh, after another, he was even he even Jane one of Jane Mansfield's early shows out in Las Vegas at the Tropicana. Roselli put that together. So every time you look up, Roselli's in the middle of something. Really a fascinating character. Yeah, you have to admire a guy that can walk the walk the line like that and have one foot in both worlds and and keep everybody happy uh, until he was seventy one years old or seventy two. <laughs> I wonder. Do you, uh, there's a lot of speculation about why he was killed. I think some people speculate because he brought down all this heat from the uh, the hearings after JFK was killed when that whole uh, CIA plot came out. I don't I don't know about that, but he must have. Uh, I can, he, he's not a kind of guy that stole from anybody, I can't imagine, although he probably did cheat people, other mobsters along the way. I never really heard any speculation other than because of the heat that came down out of the uh, the hearings after JFK was killed in the CIA plot. But you heard anything else about there's, that? Yeah, there's that speculation, uh, Gary. And it was down in South Florida. He was He was living in South Florida at the time. And so... Yeah, and there's some suspicion that, um, you know, he'd fallen out of favor with the power, bro well, you know, there was a new power regime in the, in the, in the, in the Chicago uh, outfit that, that he wasn't in with as much as he had been with, with the Giancana crowd. And so um, he was expendable. That, that, that's one theory. Another is he wasn't kicking back up enough from Las Vegas to Chicago. So several theories floating around. We're going on 45 years now and there's no, uh, it's, it's unsolved. And yeah. Most of the players who were involved aren't around anymore. So, you know, to me, it ranks as one of the great mob mysteries. It's up there with the Hoffa, the Hoffa killing. And again, the Roselli thing doesn't get as much play, but I think it will start getting some play because, you know, Lee Server told me that there are some early discussions about turning his book into a movie. Uh, very few mob figures were involved in, in, in as much high romance, high drama, high scandal as Roselli, including two of the real big, interesting power bases that have a lot of appeal to people, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Yeah, that's true. We were talking about that, that not much has been done about the Los Angeles mob scene. And there's a lot of information out there about it. Just in desperate places, Jimmy uh, Fradiano uh, uh, has a you know really uh, detailed book about his activities and you know, his, he's got started out there. So there's a, then the boats I looked up after we talked about the gambling boats and there's quite a little bit of information about that. So subculture, the gambling boats were the precursors to Las Vegas and uh, the whole thing, all the gambling out of Los Angeles area, Southern California is, was going on. And that's where Las Vegas came from basically. Yeah. You know, back East, some of the Mickey, uh, some of the Los Angeles mob, and mafia um, um, play is sort of derided as the Mickey Mouse mafia, but it was a lot more significant than than that. It was because of the money involved in places like Los Angeles and in Las Vegas. We haven't even touched on the on the on the race wire that that was a big part of the Los Angeles scene too. So there was just a lot a lot of money at play in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. That Roselli was sort of the captain of all that in in the real big money making years. In addition to the CIA things, you know, uh, he th there are so many things he's involved in. But I think you could look at the at the high drama and the romance and all those sort of things that came out of Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and it's a lot more significant than than um, than that that than a lot of people uh, really realize. Yeah, you know, I just happened to think of another uh, speculation. I believe I heard this from Red when met, Red when met. He's a former Chicago outfit. Uh, uh, some, some people call him a rat, uh, uh, but I call him he was an undercover agent because they didn't have a case on him. He volunteered and, and said, hey, I'll work on these guys for you because they're ripping everybody off and that has any kind of business that, that they can get their hooks into. And, and Frank Suisse, I think Red told me that Frank Suisse was down in Florida around this time. And that dude, and, and he was a killer for that uh, Chicago outfit hierarchy at that time when after Giancana left see Giancana was gone and he went way back with Roselli and you had a, a, you know new people running everything and, and so that you know I don't know he I think I think Red put him down as a suspect in that which wouldn't surprise me if that guy was around in the same state and somebody got killed <laughs> so Red, <laughs> he's, uh, his assertion is that 
is that, that that's who bumped off Roselli. Uh, Trace may have to be, he, he, yeah. it, it, it's not lost on him that he was down there at the same time that Roselli gets killed in Florida. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, have to, I have to give that some credence. Uh, it's a great mob mystery. And you know, we're about to find out right now we're in the middle. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of bouncing around a little bit, but right now the, the, the other, I think huge mob mystery, of course, is the Hoffa. Killing, yeah. and that's oh, yeah. pop up with the with the with the movie The Irishman coming yeah. out. But I think Roselli's is up there. You got a guy who is a major major player. I know. I think so Roselli. too. Floating in a floating in a fifty five. It's always these fifty five gallon oil drops. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't. It's kind of hard to get a body in something many smaller. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think they cut off. I think they, they cut his legs off. And yeah. Put them in the, so yeah, I think he had a terry cloth gag on his ma- in his mouth. Uh, you know, covering his mouth, yeah. and so it was a pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. his body, I think, was badly decomposed. I think at the time, as as Imagine, would be obvious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, a big mystery to, to to this day, Gary. There's uh, there's uh, you know, also speculation, but nobody really knows who bumped him off. Yeah, interesting. All right, well, Larry, this has been great. Let's uh, wind this thing down. You uh, mentioned a book uh, that you had reused to research that. Mention that book, and folks, I'll put a link to the Amazon. Uh, page for this book where talk about it's, that book in in 2018 lee server who's uh who has written some highly uh highly acclaimed biographies ava gardner uh mitchum uh samuel fuller that film director wrote a book uh that's uh called handsome johnny and so it's it's created a lot of interest it's revived a lot of interest in in uh in roselli and and a very 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 interesting book very well, re, well researched book, and in the blog post I did for the Mob Museum, um, I exchanged some emails with Server, and he gave me some good insight into how he some things he found out in, in researching the book. Let me just say, add one more too, by the way, Gary. Oh, okay. Well, I think there are three great mob mysteries, maybe more. I forgot the Bugsy. So there's there's Hoffa, oh, yeah. Roselli, Bugsy Siegel. Let Those three see. mob mysteries. We need to know what the answer is to those. Those are three great mob mysteries. You know, it, it's too bad that they didn't, that, that evidence collection was so crappy back then. If they had to save a bunch of stuff that had DNA on it, we could go to, uh, uh, we could go to these, uh, uh, what do you call it, these uh, uh DNA databases and get a relative. Maybe they were already in Ancestry.com and solved those mysteries. The, the, the evidence collection as a former officer, you know this better than anybody. Remember the two Tony? You did the thing about the two Tonys. Uh, you, you know, those famous pictures where Fradiano shot the two guys from Kansas City who were oh, out yeah. there scanning. Yeah. The, those famous pictures, Gary, of the car the, the two Tonys were shot in yeah. uh, out, 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 out in Hollywood. All those citizens standing around the car. Yeah, oh, I know, I know. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you know, the forensic evidence was was a nightmare back then. Oh, you know, it, it, it's really only changed in the last few years. I've got a picture. I'm just working on this movie about the uh, uh, Nick Savella and Carl Spiro war in Kansas City. I'm looking at some old pictures from 1984. It was the last one of these guys that got killed in the mob war. There's a picture of the car lot, the little dealership or the, the shack where he was sitting and blew him in his wheelchair up and out into the parking lot. And there's a body laying there with a uh, canvas over it. There's policemen standing around taking notes and looking, you know, gathered evidence and <laughs> drawing pictures. And there's a little kid, about a 10 year old <laughs> kid up there at the body, picking up the canvas and look underneath. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> this is 1984. Dude. <laughs> well, I, hey, by the way, I am privileged to have seen some clips of Gary's upcoming documentary and, and it is fantastic. That, Kansas City Sparrow and Savella War was is a classic, yeah. beyond classic, <laughs> uh, uh, bombings and killings and grudges, which yeah. led to, as Gary's reported, which led to really uh, some surveillance audio that broke up the Tropicana skim. Broke so, up the Tropicana, yeah. It's, it's really interesting that we have a little segment in the movie where I talk, I say it, but Bill Housley, my FBI agent, who was a case agent on that uh, skim case, say it that they planted one bug to learn about murder in the sparrows 
and they learned about Las Vegas. And then after they kind of got going on Las Vegas, they planned another bug to learn about Las Vegas, and they learned more than you'd ever want to know about the sparrows. Now, I've, I've got the transcript from that audio. They didn't save the, uh, the uh, audio, and so I'm just using actors to let, uh, you be able to hear the Savellas plot and plan and how are they going to get the, the, the sparrows. And one interesting thing is they're complaining about how their guys are lazy and won't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't want to give away too much of what you got coming, but I'm looking forward to it, the way that old school Savella crowd yeah, he wasn't happy with the uh, younger, younger guys with the bell bottoms. And the, and, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they, they, I, they, what did what did they say, uh, Gary? They thought they were hippies. And yeah, I said it looks like, like a goddamn stuff. hippie. What's with the <laughs> bell bottoms and the long hair? <laughs> I can't wait to see that documentary, Gary. I'm looking forward cool. to it. All right, Larry. So now, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, they got the, the Bob Museum blog once yeah, a month, the and there's a whole archive of those in the past. So yeah, folks, go out there. Yeah, go ahead. Talk, yeah, yeah, the mobmuseum.org um, once a month. Uh, it shows up. It's called the Mob and Pop Culture. It's on their blog tab on the Mob Museum website, and uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that's where I am. Uh, email Larry Henry five at gmail.com. If you got any uh, tips or thoughts, I'm on Facebook. I do a lot of corresponding by Facebook messenger. It's just a real quick way to reach out to people because it's instant, but yeah, Larry Henry five at gmail.com and then go to the mob museum website. And one last thing, Larry is, uh, he, he's kept the mob world summit going for Bob authors and, and filmmakers. So there's been two of them now. We we did a couple of them back in 2013, and then there's another guy was doing it, and he since died, and they quit doing them. And Mob revi uh, Larry revived it out in Las Vegas two years ago, and then last year I was unable to attend, but last year they were at the Gangster Museum in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which was an interesting location. Well, this next year we're going to have one in Kansas City, and there is a Facebook page called Mob World Summit on Facebook. So be posting things there once in a while. We're not real active on it right now. I think Larry's, Larry's posting some stuff every once in a while on that. And we got a website. Right, we have got it going. Yeah, <laughs> Go ahead, Larry. Get it going. No, but yeah, the, the, the thought was uh, to get uh, uh, mob journalists, mob authors, kind of a, a, a gathering just to talk, go over ideas, share ideas. Got a great one out in Las Vegas. We had Ron Fino, you, we had a, uh, just on and on, Frank Collada showed up. We had, uh, I know I'm going to leave some names out. The great, I think one of the best mob historians in the country, Gary, somebody who has a lot of respect from both of us, Bill Friedman. Oh, yeah. And uh, Jeff Schumacher from the Mob Museum was there. J. Michael Neota from Los Angeles, great grandson of Dra Jack Dragna, speaking of Jack Dragna. But yeah, Bill Friedman, who's, whose books, uh, I'm telling you, sitting right over here, out of, out of camera view next to my computer. Bill's books are a great resource of mine. That guy's a fantastic. Ran the castaways in the silver slipper. Um, only guy ever yeah. runs casinos in Las Vegas. So, so yeah. So, so now we're headed to Kansas City. Are you digging? I think you. Yeah, I think Gary's digging out his copy. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. There, there, yep. Gary's digging out his copies of Bill's books. Classics, classic Good. books. There it is. There it is. I've got mine sitting next next to my computer screen. Uh, Thirty illegal years to the strip, and then the one preceding that, yeah, where he gets in a lot of the gangster, uh, even a lot of the Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger stuff, uh, all against the law. Now he's working on a third, a follow up to that 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 takes from the beginning of the strip when the mob guys begin to move into the strip. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that was our first one. Then we were in Hot Springs. Hot Springs. I popped up a piece on the Mob Museum uh, site, blog site, several months ago about Hot Springs. Hot Springs is a, a fascinating mob place in itself. And then, of course, next year, next summer in June, we'll be in Kansas City. So everybody's welcome. It's going to be a lot of fun. Gary and I are talking about, uh, what, Gary, doing some bus tours maybe and having a dinner? Yeah, I, can, I, can do, I can do a mob tour, yeah. I, I got a guy I think we can we can get going. and, and We'll charge you a little bit extra for that, but uh, we'll do a mob tour in Kansas City and, and maybe end up eating someplace in a, kind of an old, uh, 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 formerly a mob-run uh, restaurant. Not run, but a uh, mob-frequented uh, uh, restaurant. So... All right, Larry, this has been great. Let me finish this off. Uh, if you have a friend or relative that have a problem with drugs or alcohol, make your first call to first call. Call 
361-5900 or go to their website, www.firstcall.org. And if you want to learn more about the mob, of course, go read Larry Henry on the uh, Mob Museum's blog. comes out once a month. Uh, you get my uh, movie. You can download it for $1.99, rent it on Amazon, Gangland Wire. I've got the Kansas City Mob Tour app in the Apple Store. Uh, I've got a book, Leaving Vegas, How FBI Agents Ended Mob Domination of Las Vegas Casinos. And I, I recommend that you get the Kindle version because I hooked all the original wiretaps to each time I used any transcripts out of the wiretaps. You can, you can click on that link and go right to a, another site and listen to the actual voices of the guys plotting and planning to take over Las Vegas and, and steal money from casinos. Uh, got anything, got any parting words of wisdom here, Larry? Just thanks for having me on, Gary. And I'm telling everybody, please look forward to Gary's next docu uh, documentary. Gary's, I think, the best documentary, mob documentary guy in the business. And this new one on the Sparrow Savella War is, is awesome. All right. Thanks, Larry. Good night, folks. Good night, Larry. Good night, Gary.